This is chapter 12, video one. Let's launch. Okay, everybody. So, um, uh, you know, again, welcome back to class. So, th well, this is going to be the video where we kind of talk a little bit about uh, salary and wages, and this is part of the Chapter 12 compensation chapter. Uh, I know it seems a little bit out of place for uh, the place that we talk about this in class, but I think that uh, you know this is an important chapter because it's going to affect you personally. But more importantly, it also has some um, some major effects when you're talking about um, different ways that salaries and everything can really be it can really affect your clients too. Um, so first of all, looking at salary and wages, essentially what we're looking at here is, uh, you know, you, you basically, you know, the first thing they're saying is that it's a fixed amount of compensation for the current year, no matter how many hours worked. That is a salary. Yes. Okay. And so that's, that's pretty much what you were going to be saying. That's if you're at the salary level. Now, what does salary mean? Salary means that you qualify for an exemption under one of the salary exemption um, uh, protocols that take place. And these are actually set by the Department of Labor uh, through uh, actions of Congress. So basically what it says is, um, look, if you qualify for an exemption um, under the hourly requirements, they can basically not have to pay you overtime if you work more than 40 hours. And typically in the accounting area, you know, we're going to qualify for the administration uh, administrative exemption, which basically says that we don't do grueling work. You have to understand that the majority of the reason why they have the overtime hours for more than 40 hours worth of work per week is because there are people who work in industries where, you know, their bodies are just being, you know, constantly abused. So, for example, construction, restaurant work, um, you know, places where you have to, you know, do a lot of running, a lot of physical activity. More than 40 hours a week is, is really, really strenuous on the body. And so in, in order to kind of encourage employers not to overwork their employees, they say, look, if you if you if you haven't worked up to 40 hours, we're going to let you you know you can charge them at, at time. If you go above above and beyond that, it's going to have to be time and a half, or even since in some cases double time. Now this is what the law says. There may be certain circumstances where you have to follow a different set of rules, and that's if you're following in in a union contract. So for example, I used to be paid um, you know it was 40 hours a week. Uh, but in my union contract, if I worked more than eight hours in a day, I got time and a half. And if I work certain days of the year, I actually got double time. So, so the, it, it can be, uh, you may, you, you know, some of these, are, these are actually going to be based off of the laws that you're seeing out here on the slide. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, you may have additional rules that, that end up having to be bar, uh, used for. So you have employees that are receiving wages generally get paid by the hour. Um, yes, um, and that's hourly employees. I, I don't really like the way that the book does these slides. I, I don't think it, it accurately describes it too much. Basically, you're going to fall in one of two categories. You're going to fall in the hourly category. You're going to fall in the salary category. And if you fall in the salary category, there's no overtime that they're required to pay you. Um, you know, like when I worked at KPMG, I'd work, you know, six, 70 hours in a week and not even a thought. Uh, there was no, no thought to bonuses. There was no thought to anything else. And so... Um, that's kind of what they uh, what they do now some companies and you know like for example here at beta we actually do what's called comp time so if you work more than 40 hours in a week you can bank it and then you can take it when we uh, when we shut down on Fridays during the summer okay uh, basically what ends up happening is that if you get your you know if you, you get salaries bonus and, and and other types of wages it will be taxed as other income or so as ordinary income and then you're going to report that on page one, line one of the of the 1040. Now that's the 10 to 2019 1040. The 2020 1040 is the same thing. Uh, it's it, that actually didn't end up changing. Uh, the next thing you're going to talk about is a, a little bit about tax withholding. So employees have to complete a W-4 and supply the information needed to correct withhold the correct amount of tax. Um, so what ends up happening here is is um, when you uh, when you start a job, one of the one of the documents they'll require you to fill out is a W four, and that W four. So employers are required to withhold uh, from your from your wages taxes. How much they're required to withhold depends on that W four. If no W four is filled out and sent in, then the then the employer is required to do max withholding at single. Okay. 
Uh, so you want to make sure that you do that so your employer has a really good idea as to what's going on. I'll tell you what, now that they've had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and got rid of exemptions, to be honest, uh, a lot of the withholding, uh, it's not as critical as it used to be. Oftentimes nowadays, you'll just go in, you'll say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm single, I'm married, uh, my spouse has a job, here's how much my spouse makes on average, um, you know, withhold at me appropriately. And they've actually come up with a new way of doing it. I've actually noticed that in the 2019 and in the 2020, as we've gotten more and more people that have filled out these, these 2020 version of, of, the w, of the W-4, more and more people seem to be withholding at the correct amount, which is actually a good thing. Okay, you'll get a W-2 at the end of the year, which basically says all of your wages. And we've talked about this in the past. There's, there's, you know, you could have summer, you know, you'll, you'll have basically six boxes. So you have box one, which is your federal taxable wage. Box two, which is what we call FIT, which is federal income tax. Um, uh, sometimes it's called federal income tax withheld, if, if FIT W is what they'll do. Uh, you'll have Social Security wages, which is box three. Box four is going to be your Social Security tax withheld. Box five, Medicare. Box six is Medicare tax withheld. Um, and as we talked about in class, one half of the, so of the social taxes are paid by you. One half of the social taxes are paid by uh, the employer. So, so that's important. So the W-2, as they say here, it's going to give you your, your income. It also provides the boxes that are necessary in order to be able to calculate your tax. These are required to be generated by the employer, and as a result of which, um, you know, they have to actually be to you by January 31st, or they could actually get into some trouble. So that's 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 really important to know. That before we've already kind of talked about. Now, one thing I do want to make sure that you guys understand is that the states will have their own versions of the W-4. So in Virginia, we have the uh, the VA-4. Uh, in Maryland, I think they call it an MW506 for some ungodly known reason. And I don't even know what it is in D.C. because I don't ever do any wages in D.C. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll just tell my, my clients just fill out the state version of it. And, of course, they, they, they're, they're very happy to do that. Uh, but each state will have their own form unless they don't have a state income tax. So, like, if you do Florida, there's none of that. So employer considerations for salary, of course, you're going to have to have the deductibility of it. Uh, you know, generally speaking, you know, if you're on the cash method, you know, you deduct salary when it's paid. If you're an accrual method taxpayer, you're going to deduct it when it's accrued. Um, but there's a couple things that you have to understand. Number one, if you want to accrue at the end of the year, you either have to pay it to an unrelated party or, and there should be an or after this because I know this is definitely an or, or it has to be paid within two and a half months after year end. So, for example, I own here at Beta Solutions. If I swap Beta Solutions from cash to accruals basis, what would end up happening is I could accrue my salary up to two and a half uh, months at the end of the year. So that's something that is actually important to know uh, because what will end up happening is if my wages aren't paid by then, then it, then it can't be done. Between you and me, this almost is never a problem. Um, you know, it, it, it is actually something that generally they um, – so it'll, it'll get done correctly, and, and it's, it's not a big deal. Um, usually, if there is any accrual for anybody, it's usually for like a couple days, and it's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's usually not a big thing. I will tell you, though, that um, uh, accrued uh, annual leave is, is another factor of this. We'll kind of talk a little bit about this in some of the benefits area, but with the um, with accrued leave, with the with the owners, if you have any accrued leave from previous years, you do have to take that within two and a half months, or you're going to end up losing it the the accrual on it at least. Uh, if compensation accrues at the end of the year is deductible when paid to a related party, the related party employee owns more than fifty percent. Again, uh, you, you know, like I said, if if you own more than fifty percent, you get to be able to do that. Uh, the after okay, and then yeah, so you you're going to be able to do the uh, the accrual at that point. So the after-tax cost of providing the salary is generally much less than the before-tax cost. That's pretty much a, a no kidding given. So, you know, if you go out there and you're going to learn and you're going to earn, you know, say, you know, you're going to work for a company and they're going to offer to pay you either, you know, $80,000 or $100,000 or whatever. This is how you kind of figure out what your, what your after-tax rate is. It's not 100% accurate because you notice that they're using the marginal rate. Well, if, if salary is the only thing that you have, is the marginal rate really your after-tax cost? And the answer is no. It's going to be your effective rate. But, of course, uh, in order to do the calculation, it's, uh, you know, this is what the book kind of ends up using. Okay, limits on deductibility. This is important. Uh, the maximum contribution that you, uh, compensation that you can do 
is a million bucks, uh, although it does apply only to CEOs, CFOs, and the three highest compensated officers. So for example, if I run a movie company and I pay and I have somebody that's that's working for me as an employee, maybe I pay him two million dollars a year, but they're not a company officer, generally he's not going to have it's not going to um, uh, not going to have too much of an effect on that because they're going to say, look, that's probably just market wage for that individual. Most movie stars and all that stuff, they're paid by 1099 anyways. And usually what will happen is the 1099 income will go from the, the studio to the, the actor's uh, personal S corporation, which then usually divvies it out if, if, if they've got good tax planning. And if they don't, uh, then, then they're, I don't know what they do. Um, but that's, that's kind of the way that that goes. Okay, guys, so that was actually a pretty quick video about uh, salary and wages. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next class.